want to welcome you all. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for coming to East Sunday. I want to hear uh, congratulations. Thank you to you for taking part in that part of service. You did a good job today. If you have seen our kids walk around, you some of them will see that they're wearing our see you at the pole bracelets. Hold them up real high, guys, so everybody can see your see you at the pole bracelets. There you go. See you at the pole is this Wednesday at uh, 7 30. Be praying for our kids, and uh, Kathy will be down there. I'm actually going to be over to my school doing see you at the pole over at Clarksville. Um, so be praying for our kids around the nation. This is the, uh, let's see, well, it started my senior high school in 1992. I remember that much. So however long that's been, 21, 2 years, something like that. Anyway, yeah, it's been a long, long time. So uh, the theme for our for our see you at the pole this year is never stop praying. And to do our to do the message today, I thought, well, what better way than to emphasize see you at the pole and to, pre to preach from this uh, from this text today. So if you would, please open up your Bibles to Ephesians 6. I'm going to be looking at verse 18 today. Ephesians 6, 18. Ephesians 6.18. And this is in the uh, all famous. I, I said to Miss June this morning, she said, What am I going to do from? I said, Ephesians 6. And she said, Oh, good. Ephesians 6. So I knew Miss June knows exactly where I'm going with today. But this is at the tail end of uh, Paul's uh, chapter on putting on the spiritual armor, putting on the armor of God. And this is, uh, this is at the tail end of that. So verse 18. It says, And pray in the Spirit on all occasions. All kinds of prayer and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always be on, and keep on praying for all the saints. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I just thank you so much today, Lord, for your word. And Lord, I just pray that you bless the speaking of your word today, Lord. Just give me the right word to say, Lord, and thank you for, for giving us this opportunity. Now, Jesus, name I pray. Amen. Amen. I want to talk about, start out first of all this morning, talking about. When I think about prayer, and I'm sure some of you guys have heard this, and I know Don probably has, but whenever I think of prayer, there is the ultimate, what do I call the ultimate prayer warrior? And this guy's name was George Mueller. Don, you heard George Mueller before? Yeah. George Mueller, he was a, well, let me just read a story. I, I actually went and did some research on him. I printed out a story. And I'll just read this story. It says, uh, the children are dressed and ready for school, but there is no food for them to eat. The house mother of the orphanage informed George Mueller. George asked her to take the 300 children into the dining room and then have them sit at the tables. He thanked God for the food and waited. George knew God would provide food for the children as he always did. Within minutes, a baker knocked on the door. Mr. Mueller, he said, last night I could not sleep. Somehow I knew that you would need, this, need bread this morning. I got up and baked three batches for you, so I will bring it in. Soon there was another knock on the door. It was the milkman. His car had broken down in front of the orphanage. The milk was spoiled by the time that the wheel was fixed. He asked George if he could use some of the free milk. George smiled and the milkman bought in 10 large cans of milk. It was just enough for 30, 30, 300 thirsty children. George Mueller was not always a person of such great faith and good character. As a young boy growing up in Germany in the early 1800s, he often stole money from his dad. As a teenager, he sneaked out of a hotel twice without paying for the room. One time he was caught by the police and put in jail. As a Bible college student, George loved going to bars, drinking, gambling, and seeing the life of the party. He loved making fun of people, especially Christians. One day, a friend invited George to go to an off-campus Bible study. He went only because he wanted to make fun of Christians later, but to his surprise, he liked the Bible study. For the first time, he saw people who really knew and loved God. He attended each evening. Before the end of the week, he knelt in his bed and asked God to forgive his sin. George's friend saw a change in him immediately. He no longer went to bars and made fun of people. He spent more time reading his Bible, talking about God, and going to church. Soon he found that his friends did not want to be around him anymore. When George told his father that he decided to become a missionary, his father became very upset. He wanted George to have a high-paying job and not be a poor missionary. He told George that he would not give him any money for school. George knew he had to do what God was calling him to do, even if his dad didn't support him. Uh, George went back to college without knowing he was going to how he was going to pay his tuition. He did something he thought was a bit silly, but for a grown man to do, he got on his knees and asked God to provide. To his surprise, an hour after, uh, an hour later, the professor knocked on his door. He offered George a paid tutoring job. George was amazed. This was the beginning of George Miller's dependence on God. After finishing college, George was ready to begin his missionary work in London, England. But there was a problem. Germany required all those men to serve at least a year in the army. George, was, George knew that he had to do the Lord's work, but he, he didn't know how he was going to go about doing it in the 
army. However, George developed an illness that was so serious that he almost died. It made him also made him unable to serve in the army. He was now free to go to England as a missionary. George became the pastor of a small church in England. The church wanted to pay him a good salary from the money he received for renting pews to rich church members who sat at the front of the church. Four members had to sit in the cheap seats in the back. Uh, George had told them that his George told them that this had to stop if they wanted him to be their pastor. Even so, he did not allow the church to pay him a salary. He trusted God to be the thing that God did. George and his family never missed a meal, and they were always able to pay the rent. George began to sense, however, that God had something else for him to do. Each day, as God, uh, George walked the streets, he saw children everywhere who had no mom or dad. They lived on the streets and, or in state-run poorhouses where they tended to, where they were treated badly. George felt God calling him to an orphanage to open an orphanage to take care of the children. George prayed, asking God to provide a building, people who oversee it, furniture, and money for food and clothing. God answered his prayers. The need of the orphanage were there were many each day. Sometimes a wealthy person would send a large amount of money, or a child would give a small amount to receive as a gift for doing chores. Many times food and supplies and money came at last at the last minute. But God always provided George without telling anyone about his needs. He just prayed and waited on God. More than 10,000 children lived in the orphanage over, over the years. When each child became old enough to live on his own, George would pray with him, put a Bible in his right hand, and a coin in his left. He explained to the young person that if he held on to what was in his right hand, God would always make sure there was something in his left hand as well. George Mueller, and you can, and that's just, that's a brief story. I read some other stories. Uh, George, they talk about how George. One night, you know, they talked about, you know, another instance when they needed bread. Uh, George went prayed, and prayed, and in the middle of the night, he received a knock on the door. He opened the door, and there was flour and wheat there at his door, just a big 50-pound 50, 50 bag. And this was a man who never stopped praying. He committed every aspect of his life to prayer, and as a result, God did great things through his life. Like I said, this year, the see what the whole thing is, never stop praying. And Ephesians 6.18, like I said before, comes at the end of, of Paul's, you know, the whole, you know, he, of his uh, armor, of, armor of God, uh, uh, part of his letter there to the Ephesians. And I mean, he covered everything from the helmet of salvation down to shawling your feet with the gospel. I mean, he covered every aspect of it. But then he comes to talking about prayer. And then he talked about you know, the, 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 the word of God, which is the sword. But he also talked about prayer. And I kind of wish, this, uh, June, that, that Joe was here this morning because I was going to talk about, you know, the prayer aspect of it. You know, if, you, if, you were to, if we were to like it today, I would say that prayer is kind of like our air support, you know. And that this whole spiritual battle that we're, we're down in the trenches. And we use prayer to call for that air support. And so, you know, and, and when we look at every part of the scripture here, Paul breaks it down into different parts. How, how, he tells how to pray in a variety of ways. The first thing he does, he says, he pray, he says, pray always. And we can interpret this as what I like to call a number, as a number one, if I have my points up, I'm not as good as John is, but if I have my points up, right, then the number one point is God calls us to do perpetual prayer. Perpetual prayer. And first, you know, we, we know the scripture from 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, when Paul, when Paul says to the Thessalonians, pray without ceasing. Now, this would be the point of the message if I would do this down the youth room, where I'd have, where I'd have some teenagers rolling their eyes back in their head, and I, I would say, no, that doesn't mean, where's Urban at? That's it, okay? That would be the part where I would say that it doesn't mean that we're on our knees 24 7. Rather, it means that we need to maintain a prayerful attitude. Okay? And I like to brag on my mother, who she passed away a long time ago, but I still like to use My mother was one who had a prayerful attitude. She would, you know, as she was walking down the road, as she was taking her morning walk, she would thank God. She would she'd thank God, God, you've made such a, you know, you've made a beautiful day today. You have, you, have, you know, thank you for, you know, thank you for the, for the cool temperatures. And I mean, she was constantly thanking God. When she was preparing a meal, it was one of those comforting things that I miss the most about my mother. But whenever she'd be preparing a meal, I could hear her in the kitchen singing praise and worship me. You know, whenever we were in the car, my mom, I mean, if it, it wouldn't be that, you know, as a teenager, I wasn't crazy about praise and worship music, but she'd have the radio turned on, even if, ever so quietly, she still had it turned on, and she was constantly in that mindset. She was constantly in that prayerful mindset that, you know, she was she was doing that for everything. She had her mind prayerfully 
and sit on Jesus all day long. So we need to be praying always. We need to have perpetual prayer in our spiritual battle. The number two thing that Paul said there is that we need to be praying with supplication or petition. Paul says that we that here that our spiritual warfare, that this is part of our spiritual warfare. We need to pray for all things. And sometimes I think that we feel that since God knows everything, we don't need to pray for everything. Oh, God knows everything about us. God knows that I, I need this part of my job, or I need this, you know, I need to drive safely to work. God knows that I, He doesn't need me to pray about that. And I mean, I think that's some of the mindset that we have. I think sometimes our prayer life reveals what we believe about God. That's right. You know? Yeah. I think sometimes we just say, okay, God, this is a really big thing. This is a really big request, God. And, you know, and sometimes, how many, how many times have we heard this? God, if you just answer this one prayer, I'll... Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we enter into the contract phase with God. If you do this, I'll do that. If you don't do this, well, then the contract is with Nolan Boyd. You know, and it reveals what we feel about who God is. Right. You know, do we just go to him on the big things, or do we go to him on all things? You know, we must bring all of our prayers to him. I'm going to look real quick. Flip over to Philippians 4. Philippians 4, verse 6. It says, Philippians 4 is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. But he says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. What's that translated into? You know, I, I, I have found that, and again, I go back to my mother, she, she would, my mom told me the story on my wedding day with Janine. She said, I've been praying for this day since you were two years old. What? What, what are you saying, Mom? She said, I was praying for your future wife when you were a toddler. God laid it upon my heart when you were about two years old on your second birthday to start praying for your future wife. That was, that was better than any dish set or silverware set that I could have gotten that day as a gift. Yeah. Because to me, that, that said something that my mother had prayerfully considered my life that far back. She, you know, some people say, oh, surely, man, remember, you're silly for praying that. You know, God, you know, we can, 